Shalom, everyone. Welcome to Jerusalem Lights, here from Jerusalem, from Arkansas, and even from the Golan Heights here in Israel today. Jim and I are always um, excited to bring special guests when we're able to, and we really enjoy getting to hear from old and new friends, their perspectives on their journey throughout this world. Today, we have a, a very old friend with us, Yocheved, Mrs. Woodward, who makes her home here in the north of Israel, uh, in the Golan Heights. Um, Yocheved, we've been friends for, I think, close to 30 years. But yes. uh, maybe you could introduce yourself. Um, well, Yocheved Woodward, as you said, and uh, uh, my husband and I both live in, in the north, and we've actually made Aliyah about eight years ago from Texas, which um, I'll share more about that as I share our, our journey. So glad to be here with, with both of you. It's very, very exciting to, to get to see you. Um, I'm looking back over the years, and it's 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 hard to believe it, but we actually met, I'm thinking it's close to 30 years ago. Oh, that's when Correct. we met for the first time. And you weren't Yocheved then. Um, no. And you, and you also weren't Jewish then. That's right. And so uh, you've been through so many different... Um, so many different stages of life, which is really, really amazing. But if, I, with your permission, I, I would, I would just like to um, relate, if it's possible, um, the circumstances under which we met. That would be nice. Back in the in the in the very early nineties, uh, I came to speak in a little red brick Baptist church uh, in the North Texas, just over the border from Oklahoma. Actually, the reason that I came there, I was invited to come there because they. This group of people had a candidate for a red heifer, like uh, <laughs> in a yard, in the yard next to the church that they wanted me to inspect for the red heifer. It was it was quite an experience. Uh, I, I hadn't um, been exposed to that kind of thing uh, too often, and I came to speak uh, about the Torah in this in this little uh, church, and there in the front row. And so, and so as I'm waiting to go on to speak, um, they're singing some hymns, you know, some Christian hymns. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, uh, an experience, you know, and, I'm, and, I, and they're not my cup of tea exactly. And they're singing about things that I'm <laughs> absolutely in total diametric opposition to as far as, you know, being washed in the blood and that sort of thing. So I'm standing there kind of, you know, kind of like stone faced, you know, and just waiting for them. And respectfully, I'm just standing, okay, this is their thing. I'm waiting for them to finish. And then these two women that are in the front row that every time they start a new hymn, they get up and they go out into the into the side, and they go into the hall, into the bathroom, and they start turning on all the faucets and flushing all the <laughs> toilets and making like a whole ruckus. And it was you and our dear friend it Alice. Was. Rabbi, we were so offended. Here they had this holy rabbi from Yerushalayim in their, their midst, and they're really not being respectful by, <laughs> by doing that. And, and of course, being from the church background, we knew exactly what they were doing, and and we were trying to drown out their noise. We didn't know we couldn't stand up and say stop. So that was our way to protest the way that you were being received and treated in that situation. We we just couldn't have it. We couldn't be silent. It was so so. I had, we hadn't offensive. even met. I didn't even know who you were. It was a surreal experience for me because <laughs> because on the one hand, I'm trying to I'm trying to you know you were keep flushed my with composure. excitement. I'm sorry, Jim. <laughs> I said it was a bad joke. I said, so they were flush with excitement. <laughs> I'm trying try to keep my composure. And, and these two women, uh, they were they're like, you know, like warriors with like this righteous, righteous indignation. And they keep going. And, and they're obviously like trying to make some sort of a distraction. That was, that was like basically our, um, our Shalom Aleichem. <laughs> That's it's something I'll never forget. Oh, my. But you were so gracious. You just, I don't know, you... You just well, took it and and got up and gave the most wonderful message about repentance, and uh, it was really a special special time for me, very special. So I think that was, like I say, in the very early nineties, and so I, you had not been long out of the church yourself at that time. Is that correct? That is correct, and and uh, <clears throat> we had actually. Um, Trying to think exactly the the sequence of, of the times, 
um, we had had come to realize that that there were things about the Christian faith that were not true, and we were searching for what the correct path for it would be. And we had no idea at that time about B'nai Noah. And Vendel Jones, who was a B'nai Noah in Texas, who's no longer with us, um, had an assistant, a, a Jewish assistant by the name of Renee Batchelor. And she suggested that we we uh, write to you and to Rabbi Yoel Schwartz. She, she said, I think that they would be help you to t- teach you the proper path for a non-Jew. And you responded. He did also, but you're the one that Hashem wanted to, for us to really connect with and have a relationship with. And it's it's a major part of our whole story, of our whole uh, transition that we've made is because you and your lovely Rena, wife Rena have been there t- to really help us and encourage us and teach us and answer our questions. And we wouldn't be here without the two of you in our life. Can I remind our audience also that, you know, and tell us the year, because back then there were hardly any resources for yes. someone who wanted to learn about the Sheva Mitzvot, right? So this you were, is true. I mean, you went right to the top with Rob Schwartz. So uh, where where did you actually begin? Where, you know, go back to the beginning. How did you get to that place where you met Rabbi Richmond that day? Well, the Reader's Digest, our answer to that question is Hashem's mercy on our life. That's right. how we got there. But he he just arranged things for us. Uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, oh, how do you condense your life into an hour? Uh, I was born in Texas. I was raised a Christian, one sister. Um, I had a an experience when I was nine year, years old in church. My my parents were both Christian, but they're of different Protestant faiths. My my dad was a Methodist, my mother was a Baptist, and and the church was right a catty corner from each other. So we were taken to church. He went to his. We went with mother, and then, as was to prove in a few years, my mother uh, had undiagnosed leukemia for about five or six years before she passed away. And by the time they diagnosed her, she only lived five weeks. So there was a lot of of, uh, changes and turmoil because of that illness in the home. And um, by the time I was nine years old, my parents had stopped going to church, but I still was sent to church, which I resented. I I didn't understand why I couldn't stay home and, I don't know, read the funny papers or sleep late or whatever I thought they did. But because of that, my unsupervised attendance at church after Sunday school I would go up in the balcony with a little friend of mine and we'd sit there and giggle and whisper and write notes and and um, not really behaving in proper decorum for being in the church. Nine years old, I'm sitting there giggling with my friend. And all of a sudden, my name is, I, I, I make it, a, I say it, I describe it as akin to the sound a waterfall makes whenever it's flowing booming my name and it was so profound I jumped up in my seat and turned around to see who was yelling in church and I realized everybody just sitting there you know listening to what was going on and and this this uh, knowing dawned on me that oh that's God and I'm being naughty and I'm in big trouble so I became very sober after that and began to really think about God and and uh, who he was and what he was in my life because I loved him I actually love to go to church. I don't know why I was acting up so the way that I was. But anyway, that's that's the reality of it. But Easter Sunday was coming up. And so I made this, this decision that I was going to dedicate my life to him and go through the Christian steps of becoming a Christian on Easter Sunday. So that fateful day arrived, and I sat downstairs and not in the balcony at the back of the church, which was a mistake because it was a long walk down that aisle. When the invitation was given, I went down and I said I wanted to give my life to to God. And and the pastor startled me because he said, well, where are your parents? And I thought, well, what's that got to do with anything? And I said, well, they're at home. And he said, well, well let's, let's have them come back with you tonight. So I went home, puzzled, told them what I'd done, and... Um, as an adult now, I'm sure that that it was very stunning and hurtful that I had done such a thing without telling them about it. 
So I, I was in trouble at home for having done that. And that night we all went back to church together and and uh, I, I was smarting from the correction I'd received for my actions. But they they did allow me to go ahead and follow through with my wish and, and into the baptistry and be baptized as is the custom in the Baptist church. Um, but it started me off of my walk with God rebellious. I, I really had this seed of rebellion in me from that. And and then, as I said, my mother was ill and we didn't know it. And unfortunately, they didn't have the diagnostic knowledge that in those those days for leukemia. And and she did go on diagnosed for a number of years and she suffered greatly. I can't even imagine how terrifying that must have been for her looking back. But um, when I was not quite 14, she died. And uh, very shortly thereafter, my father remarried. And, and uh, then I quit going to church completely and didn't even try to return until I was uh, 24 years old and going through my own crisis of my own making. Um, when I lost my, my uh, felt like I lost my father when he remarried, I actually ran off to old Mexico at the ripe old age of 15 and married a high school sweetheart. Wow. And um, he was in the army. And when he got stationed in Germany, I joined him at age 16. So at 17, I gave birth to my first child, lovely daughter, Laura. She's now 60 years old <laughs> with three children of her own and her first great grandchild. So um, anyway, it, you know, you can't get married at that age and just, you don't know what you're doing and I hope for it to last. And and sure enough, we ended up divorced. I had a, a son too um, with my first husband. And uh, by the time I was 24, I was divorced and facing raising children with uh not a good education and and uh, and no no in the tag home. So I got really serious about uh, finding God again and started going back to church. And I chose to go to this very strict denomination of the Church of Christ for this reason. My older sister is two and a half years older than me, also had been through some very difficult things as an adult. And she was going to the Church of Christ. Our mother had actually searched before her death, and she told my father, she said, I, I have checked out what I think is the best way for you to raise the girls, and I, I hope you'll raise them in the Church of Christ. I think they try the hardest to, to follow, follow what the Bible says. So he agreed to do that, and my sister was agreeable to go, but little rebellious me, I wanted to stay in the Baptist Church. But by, by me rejoining my search for God in the, in the Church of Christ, my husband that was God was going to send in my life five years down the road was from a family that for 200, no, for 100 years in his family, you either went to the Church of Christ or you didn't do anything. I mean, it's the only church that was acceptable in his family. And Hashem, in ordering my steps, had me get into that denomination so that I would be acceptable to his family whenever we were going to get married. And that's just the way that, that Hashem loves you and directs your steps when you don't even know. So that that was my return to um, um, trying to walk with God. And, and a lot of good things happened. And, you know, Rabbi Richmond, you, you, may, you may or may not remember this, but I asked you at one time after you and I met, how could I have such a close relationship with God when I was on a path that was was it not a true a true law, a true connection to God? And you told me, because I, I said, I have children I love, I have family I love, friends that I love, and they're all uh, on this Christian path. And I was too, and yet God dealt with me, interacted with me in a very personal way. And you said, you'll have it. Oh, I was not you have it then. I was, I was Andrea then. You said, Hashem has no, it's not, does not need time. He has. He doesn't have to walk. He knows the beginning from the end, and he said he 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 orders your life so that you will. It isn't surprising that you were there, and you told me how why he had allowed the Christian faith to come into the world when the Second Temple was destroyed and and the Jews were fleeing for their lives. How are we supposed to be the night light to the nations 
when we're we're being scattered from pillar to post. And at that time, you either knew that the God of Israel was was real, or you were a pagan. That's basically all there was to offer in the world. And you told me, you said he allowed Christianity to come in and bring decency and civility to the world in a way that would be accessible to the non-Jew, because we certainly weren't going to be teaching while we're running for our life. And he said, you don't have to worry about your, your friends and your family. Hashem sees their heart. He knows who loves them. Yes, they'll be embarrassed when they return to him and they realize they depended on, that depended on a middleman to get to, to connect, but he understands that. His love for all of his creation allowed that to happen. So I was able to accept at that point that we all have our own path. We all have our own path. And, and my four children are still uh, not with us in our walk. And that's okay because God loves them even more than he loves me. And I can trust him that they're doing what they need to do because they're they're amazing people. They, they really are. They're beautiful people. Um, so how did I get from there to... <laughs> Well, the transition, the transition from that world to, to the, you know, the transition from the, that stage of being in the church to the, your decision to become a Noahide altogether. Yes, yes. Um, in 19, well, let's see, I met my husband in 1976. Um, turns out, even though we lived in different towns, I had gone to school with his a first cousin of his, and and her older brother was actually high school sweethearts with my sister, and they were even talking marriage in college. And but I never met him. I think if I had not run off at fifteen, I probably would have always been married to him. That's what we think anyway. <laughs> he married at nineteen when he was in college, and I married at fifteen when I was still wet behind the ears to other people. But five years after I began walking with God, I, I met him through my cousin, my his cousin, my high school friend. And we were married in, in 17, 1976, and our whole heart was just to whatever, wherever life took us, we wanted everything that we were and everything that we have to be totally used by God. And so we were very active in the church world. In 1990, uh, the Gulf War was brewing, and... I had always, before we married, he asked me where I wanted to go on our honeymoon. And I said, I want to go to Israel. I've always wanted to go to Israel. And he said, well, let's start saving for that trip. And he said, whenever we we can, we'll go. It really seemed like the impossible dream at that time. We couldn't imagine really being able to make a trip to Israel. This was 1990. Uh, in 1990, we the Gulf War was brewing, and I looked at him. We got busy raising the children. He brought two ch children to the marriage. I had two children I brought to the marriage raising our children, getting them through college, et cetera, getting them married. And I said, we never did make that trip to Israel. If we don't go now, who knows? It's It may be so difficult to travel to the Middle East, we'll never get to go. So we went. I was expecting to see all these places I read about in the Bible where, where the J-man walked. And I, I, was, I was totally unprepared for the impact that being in the land would have upon me. I was so glad to be there, so excited. But so many of the, the, the Christian sites absolutely were very uh, offensive to me. They were gaudy, and, and I was I was confused. I was not understanding some of the feelings I was having. I know when we were at the wall at the hotel, I, I was so happy. I just I just wanted to hug the wall and just stay there. And when we went to uh, Tavaria, where the Canaret is, I... I was, there were parts about the land that just spoke to me and resonated. And there were some Christian sites I expected to be excited about that, that I wasn't. And I couldn't tell anybody. It's like, what's wrong with me? What kind of a Christian am I that I'm here and I'm having these conflicted feelings? So time to get back on the plane and go back to Texas. And life in Texas was wonderful. But I just wanted to cry. I just felt after that first trip, my whole life was predicated on I felt like I'd left part of my heart in the land, 
And I was always scheming to how can we get back? How can we get back? So over the years, we managed, we managed to travel seven times together to come back just because I couldn't get enough of the land. We didn't come back again until 1998. And that's after I had met you, Rabbi. And, and we had begun um, studying. We actually, in our church pursuit, we had, had uh, as we read the Bible, I, I really became, became a, a digger. I, I would dig things out instead of just sitting on the pews and listening to what the sermons were, which were repetitious over and over usually. I began to study for myself and, and see all these contradictions in the Christian Bible. And it was in a desire to find out what's missing. How do, there are things that don't quite line up with this. And so I began digging. And um, we had we had uh, meetings at our home. It, it became like a home Christian church. Not that we led. We, my husband and I, are both were, were followers. We're worker bees. We're not leaders. So there was there was a, a minister that did the teaching, but we actually had church in our home. And then he passed away, and we started searching for another place to go. Which I have to tell you, our children are amazing. They watched their parents bounce from denomination to denomination as they grew up. We never just raised them in one particular spot because we were searching for a way to to fill in the gaps and find out. There's a scripture in the Christian Bible that says that if you um, if all of the if all the things that the J man did were written down, all the books in the world wouldn't contain those things. And I thought, well, maybe the answers are in those unwritten things, but but why would God leave us hanging and not knowing everything that we needed to know about how to live our life? So we searched, we searched, and they watched us. They watched us bounce around from one thing to another. So their roots really got never got deeply down into any particular denomination for which I'm thankful today. But um, I'm sorry. I, listen, y'all, forgive me. I'm 78 years old. I lost my chain of thought. I'll be back with this thought in a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we ended up when when Kid Heaven's Church at our house. We ended up at a Baptist church, and unknown to us, that Christian Baptist minister was also being drawn to Torah, and he was researching wow. the Hebraic roots of Christianity at the time that we joined his church. And the first night that we went on a Wednesday night to to a prayer meeting, he got up to speak, and and he said. I was going to talk about this and this, but he said, I feel like that the Lord is speaking to me to talk about this and said, and my husband kind of nudged me. We thought this is a man that tries to follow God, not just give us the canned version of, of, of being a Baptist. So we, we started going there and soon, very soon found out that he was interested in the Torah and in studying the roots of Christianity through the Hebrew and we had just returned from, from Israel and knew what an amazing impact it had on your life. So my husband and I started a, a project to um, raise enough money to send he and his wife to, to Israel. And in 1992, they went. And like us, they came back completely changed <laughs> and on a new path. And I guess it was, um, well, he didn't last too long in the Baptist church after that. There, There's local autonomy with each church. And so they tried to vote him out, and we went expecting for him to get voted out, and then we would follow him, find out where he went, and follow him and sit under his teachings, because he really was teaching Torah, beginning to teach Torah at that time. And lo and behold, Hashem had a different plan. Um, he was he was kept. People came out of the woodwork that were on the, the baptistry rolls that, that uh, voted for him to be kept. So the people that were angry and wanted to get rid of him lost, and they had to leave. And so he stayed there. And for another two years, he continued to preach. But as he studied more, he realized that Christianity was not was not a true path. And he resigned and went to work at, at a Walmart warehouse at, for, at midnight and loaded trucks in order to take care of his family, just walked away from his uh, 17, 18 years of being in the ministry. Because he wanted the truth. He said, I'm just going to sit and study Torah for the rest of my life. Well, we ended up again opening our home to have the church, the, 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 we weren't church anymore, but had the fellowship uh, meet in our home. And uh, this went on for about almost two years. And by this time, our children were married with families of their own. And they lived, they didn't live in the town where we did. And when they would come to visit on the weekend, we were always having 
people studying the Bible in our home. And finally, they voiced a complaint about that. And so we got to thinking about it. It really wasn't fair. And we spoke to, to our leader about it. And he said, well, you know, we'll just meet at my house. Yeah, And uh, we started meeting at his home. At that time, as you said, Jim, there were there often there weren't so many resources for us, uh, and so we did a lot of things, thinking we knew what we were doing when we really didn't. It's whenever we began to have uh, teaching from from our, our Rabbi Hayim and uh, and the few books that we could scare up that we began to understand what was for the the difference between the service of a Jew and a non Jew. So our leader took a, a, a scripture in the Christian Bible that says, and I don't know why Christians don't think about this, but it said, if you break the least commandment in the Bible, in the in the in what we call the Old Testament then, and teach others to do so, you'll be the least in the kingdom of heaven. And he called us together for a meeting and he said, uh, y'all are going to have to quit coming to my house on, the, on Sabbath because we were all trying to keep the Sabbath and, and still meet together on Saturday. And we were like, what do you mean? And he said, well, you're having to drive to come here. And, and that's a violation of Shabbat. So stay home. Don't come. And we said, well, what are we supposed to do? And he said, I don't know, but you can't come here. So we all went to our corners and began to cry out to God. What are we going to do now? You know, we've, we've finally come together with like-minded people that want to follow Torah, that want to, to live according to what God wants us to be, and now we can't even meet. So we began to look at the possibility of buying homes in a neighborhood together. You've got to realize that we were probably had four or five different towns that came. people came from surrounding towns for us to be together, some even as far away as Dallas. And... Uh, we looked at buying land uh, in Colorado. We, looked, we we searched all sorts of possibilities. How can we stay together as a group, as a community, and uh, uh, still begin learning, uh, continue learning? And um, during that time, it is, there's so many. I, I can't, I just want to encourage every one of you. I don't care where you are or what your situation is. Hashem has a path for you. And he's more than capable of working out the details to be sure that you have opportunity to get catch on and walk down that path that he's opening for you. We were all at home crying out to God about what's next. And within a two and a half month uh, period of time, month period of time, all of us separately received either the whole set or one tape of a, of a Rabbi Tobia Singer's tapes in a, in a ministry he had called Outreach Judaism. And it really was his whole purpose in life. He had found, had discovered when he was a teenager about the missionary efforts uh, to, to get Jew, Jews to become Christians. And he was very offended by that. And it led him into devoting his whole life to rescuing Jews from error. And so he had this set of teaching takes. That so long ago, that's when we had cassette reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And... <clears throat> um. As I say, it, it was just a sovereign act of him to make sure that everyone from that group either had the whole set of tapes or at least one of the tapes that would give insight and make us realize. Because by this time, we, it had been eight years of study. We had studied enough of Torah that we had realized that the J-Man wasn't God, but we still weren't completely out of, of our roots. We still had fuzziness on what the truth was. And after listening to those tapes... We began to timidly, cautiously approach one another and say, we need to talk about this. And the thing about it is, we had done so many, <clears throat> excuse me, we had done so many searches, so many different rabbit trails that we ran down ran down that turned not to, to be true. I never told my husband, because the, the tape that I got a hold of was teaching from Torah how you don't need blood to have forgiveness for sin. And that 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 took the whole need of the whole thing that my faith had been based on. I mean, I was so devastated. I actually went into grief. I actually did because my God had died. I didn't know what to do with her, all the stages of grief. And I thought, this is going to be the last straw for my precious husband. He 
we've been together in all these searches and sometimes he was ahead of me in his understanding and sometimes I get ahead of him. But I said, this is it. To totally give up the J-man, this, this is going to be the death of my marriage. So I didn't tell him. For three months, I didn't tell him, but I was such a basket case for realizing all the lies that I told and the people I had steered wrong and the life that I'd lived. By this time, I was um, in my 40s, and I was, I'd was i raised my children to believe the lie, and I was just, I was destroyed. And so I wouldn't tell him. I thought, I can't tell him. Well, our, our Baptist pastor, <laughs> who had, you know, left left the church and was working at Walmart unloading trucks, they were very close. And he would often come over. We lived on a, a plot of land that had a, five acres that had a stock pond on it. And very often to, to get away and, well, really, he did this while he was still in the church world. But he would come to our home and go down to the fishing pond way out of the place and sit and fish and be alone with God. My husband came in from a, a trip he had made on as a railroad engineer. He came home. He said, what's the preacher down, doing down there? And I said, I didn't even know he was here. Goes down to the to the dock to talk to him. And um, thank God, he said to my husband, he said, I need to talk to you about something. And he said, yeah, what is it? He said, I need to tell you that Jesus is not real. Wow. And really, my husband should, should be telling this because he, he was so stunned. He said, you know, I don't know whether to believe you or knock you off this dock. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, you can knock me off the dock if you want to, but I'm telling you the truth. So he so loved this man and trusted his integrity that over the next few weeks, he examined the evidence for himself and he knew it was true. So little by little, from that day forward, we, as I say, we all began to come back together and, and talk to each other. And, and we realized God had, had revealed this to all of us. It, we had one family that was up in Colorado, and they got a set of the tapes. And my best friend, the one that, that was flushing the toilet and running the water with me and in low when we first met Rabbi, she had gotten a, a Moment magazine, which is a Jewish magazine that had an advertisement in it to, to order these, these outreach Judaism tapes. And she had taken straight to to our leader and said, I want you to listen to these things and see if what this, this rabbi is saying is true. And, and he listened to him and he said, it's true. One by one, we began to all reveal to each other that we all had one way or another received either a set of the tapes as a gift or re recorded copies of the tape. And so now we're conveyed. Now what do we do? Well, very shortly, nearly everyone in that group began to move somewhere where they could go through conversion. Now, some of them did reform or, or, and, or conservative conversions and later had to do it over again, the orthodox correct way to do it. But little by little, they all began to move away and, and go through conversion and become Jewish. And that's when Renee Batchelor, the Jewish assistant to Vendel Jones, suggested that we talk, to, that we write to Rabbi. He responded so lovingly and so compassionately, and then we met him at Enlo and uh, at, at the at the Flushing, <laughs> and that was the beginning of of his teaching us what Hashem had for us. And we'd never heard of B'nai Noah, sons of Noah, but um, I wanted to go ahead and convert like everyone else did. But my husband said, "Look." We've already put enough division between our children and ourselves by stopping the Christian holidays, by not going to to church events. We we wouldn't go. We wouldn't step foot in the church after we learned the truth. And he said, besides, I'm in I'm in the the last quarter of my working years. He said, if I walk away from a, a job that pays the bills in a in a retirement that we can live on, he said, what are we going to do? Become Jews and become a financial burden to the Jewish people? Um, he he's a he's a very intelligent man with a college degree, but he he has ADHD and reading has just always been his nemesis. He's studying. His gifts and talents are not in that area. And we looked at the model of who a Jewish man is today, and they study. They all study. You know, and it and he could see oh, all the things incumbent upon a Jewish man, and he really didn't think he would be able to to do that. 
So he said, no, we're going to be B'nai Noah. And I said, okay. Um, I even had a conservative rabbi suggest to me one time that I could go ahead and convert. And, and I said, no, I can't. I said, I don't want a divorce. He said, oh, you don't have to get a divorce. And I said, I'm supposed to have a Jewish home and be a real Jew. And anyway, he seemed to think that it'd be okay. And, and I had learned enough that I knew that that wasn't going to happen. And I said, no, I'm, I can't do that. But anyway, we some of our friends um, had joined the Dallas community and their conversion, Orthodox community there. And we began to go, we had to get permission. As B'nai Noah, we had to, there was, it was a Kolel community. Balshiva primarily, uh, the Kolel had come there. Out of the thousands of Jews that that lived in Dallas, there were um, less than 100 families that that were observant. And so they had started a, an outreach program to, to bring Torah to Jews. And when there were certain special speakers, we had to get permission to come to those meetings. Um, we, we were not allowed to go to Shabbat. We were told that, you know, Shabbat, that we learned then that Shabbat was a, a covenant between Hashem and the Jewish people only, so far as keeping Shabbat. We wouldn't be allowed to, to read the prayers that, that they used. I, I couldn't say Avraham Yitzhak and Yaakov were my forefathers because I was not Jewish. And so they said, there's really not a place for you on Shabbat, but but they would let us come to some of the conferences that they had, special speakers, um, would get permission to go to certain tour classes that they taught at the Kolel. But they always really um, were careful to teach us what, what they felt was appropriate for non-Jews. But we got to be accepted as not there to missionize. We, we were accepted as, as true lovers of Torah uh, for many, many years. And... Uh, then my, my friends all, they moved away from the community. And so I still, we live three hours away from Dallas. And so it was a six hour round trip by car to drive in to one of these classes I was allowed to, to attend. And my husband was still working and I was not. So I got to go a lot more than he did. And we ended up buying a, a small condo in the Jewish community there. And I would often stay overnight so that, that I didn't have to just turn around and make it a, a six-hour trip on the road to, to go to an hour of Torah. And little by little, they, they allowed me to be a, a work in the library at the Kolel. And I got to know people in the community. And, and I was accepted as, as a, a bona fide non-Jew that, that loved Torah and loved Israel and, and loved the Jews, loved the God of Israel. So... That's where we were and for 18 years. In, in 2000, I'm going to tell you this, in 2000 and so many things, let me get my thoughts straight here. Um, in the year 2000, the Cardoza School of Law in Manhattan sponsored a Bonanoa conference. And we bought our airline tickets to go and very excited, expecting to meet all these Bonanoa because we were for few and far between at the time. There, there were no congregations. I don't know if there's still no congregations. I'm not really sure how that's going in, throughout the world now. But Hashem is 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 drawing hungry hearts to the source. This this was this was always the problem, as, as you said, Jim. There weren't many resources, and as we walked that path for for 18 years, of course, Rabbi, you you began to teach and were a source of. You were the main diet for our Torah learning, but there were other sources too. And um, in 2008, we were all together at a conference in, in Florida, and uh, there was a young man there, Joel Bask, I think was the rabbi's name, and he had written a book, and on the back of it was a picture that the Hubble spacecraft uh, camera had taken, I think. It, it shows, it was. he said, this is indicative of what's happening in the world. The, the bright light in this picture was in the middle, and he said, that's the Jew. And that outer circumference of that circle looked like it had pieces of, of brown things flying off. And he said, this is the husk being taught, taken off of the eyes of the world as, as um, they're coming and grabbing the zitzies of a Jew and saying, we want to go with you because now we know God is with you. He said, this is what's happening in the world. And he said, when I went to yeshiva, I kept saying, he said, I had such a hunger to teach the Sheva Mitzvot. And nobody was interested in it. But but he said, I dug out. I got busy and I dug out what a, a non-Jew needs to know. And I've written this book about it. And I, and the whole conference was about how 
uh, or his his uh, contribution to the conference was about how the Jew needed to be teaching, be, be ready to teach the hungry soul. And it's it's just happening in preparation for these times that we're living in. God is collecting the people that, that love him. And as you tell us all the time, Rabbi, it's a Torah for all people. We have distinct, different job descriptions, but it's a Torah for everyone because Hashem loves all of his creation. And um, at this conference in, in Manhattan, Rabbi Schwartz is one of the ones that had come to speak. And it's my understanding that's the first time he'd ever left Israel. But when he, one of the things he said in his in his lecture was that for 20 years he felt like almost like a lone voice because no one was interested in preparing to teach the non-Jew. And he said, we need to get ready. It, the conference turned out not to have Noahides there. I think there were 10 Noahides at the conference. The, the rest were all Orthodox Jews from the five areas of New York that had come to this conference. And the message was, the Gentiles are coming and saying, teach us, and we're not ready. That was the theme of the whole conference. But we got to spend some private time with, with Rabbi Schwartz. And it's so interesting. Whenever my husband, when I would ask a question, he would look at, he wouldn't even, he was, his practice was not to look at a woman whenever uh, he was around her. He would look at my husband to answer my questions. But one of the things he told us at that private time with him um, I broke down and cried at one point. I said, you know, we, we had to quit during Shabbat. Uh, you know, we, we've had, we made so many mistakes. And and uh, well, there was a way that we could acknowledge Shabbat, but we had to stop the practices we were doing and that were, were like a Jew. Even though I have to tell you, I never kept, I never kept Torah uh, one Shabbat perfectly at, at all because I didn't even know what all was required. <laughs> so I was in no danger of but it, the, the rule is that if you are not Jewish and you want to celebrate Shabbat, you have to be sure you violate. Well, I'm telling you, in ignorance, I violated it all the time. But I just stopped doing anything for a long time because when I found out that it, it, that it was not a covenant for me, that it was between Hashem and the Jewish people, I had followed wrong thinking so much I just stopped I just stopped doing everything and that was like ripping my heart out but that's that's what we did that's what we chose to do so anyway when I told Rabbi Schwartz that I wanted so badly to be Jewish he looked at my husband and he said we have many converts to Judaism but we have so few Jews this still makes me cry that understand the Gentiles' place in Torah. You will be far more valuable to the Jewish people if you will continue your work as B'nai Noah. And he said, there are only eight commandments. He said, we can't do a lot of the commandments because we don't have a temple. And he said, you're a woman, so there's a lot of commandments that even if you were Jewish, you wouldn't be able to do, or are not. you're not required to do. He said, with the exception of eight things, he said, you can practice, you can practice being a Jewish, you can learn while you continue to live as a Noahide. <laughs> and then he said, when you're old and tired and out of energy and can't work anymore to spread the B'nai Noah message, then you can convert. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm 78. I've been a Jew for 12 years. So <laughs> we did what he said. But actually, remember, my husband said, it's too much. It's too much. I, I could never take that on. Um, fast forward to um, 2008, whenever his mother passed away. Um, we were, we were, he was retired by then. We had actually moved to the little town of 5,000 in West Texas where she lived so that he might help his um, sister take care of her as she aged. And she was um, she was 88 years old whenever she passed. Um, anyway, after she passed away, he, he spent almost a year settling her estate. Um, we came to Israel for another trip and stayed for a couple of months. We went back home. We just, uh, so hard to leave Israel and come back to, to Texas. So we got in our motor home. We took an 18-state trip. We did everything to try to distract ourselves. 
Well, in the meantime, at one point in our, our life, as B'nai Noah, the we, we were we learned that the Dallas community had a real problem. It was such an in such an affluent area of Dallas. It's really hard for young people that were just getting started to afford the price of housing to live in the era of you have to live in a live in a limited area as a Jew so that you're able to walk to the synagogue on to the shul on on Shabbat. And uh, so we thought, okay, we'll buy a town home and we'll make it available at affordable rent so the young family can afford to to start there and, and raise their family while while they you know, progress in their professions and are able to afford to live here. And that's what we had done. So we had a, for one year, we had some a, a young family there. We came back from this effort to distract ourselves from, from not being in Israel anymore on the, the trip we'd made. Um, and our tenant said, we're moving. And this was in 2010. And my husband looked at me and he said, well, I guess it's our turn. And I said, our turn for what? And he said, let's go to the rabbi and head of the Beit Din in Dallas and see if they'll accept us into the conversion program to become Jewish. And I, I was astounded. I, I couldn't believe that he was saying these words. He knew how badly I wanted to be Jewish, but he knew that I was committed to live my life as, as Noahide so that we could live it together. And uh I said, I never knew you would you would want to do this. And he said, oh, I always knew we would someday. And I said, why so long? He said, as long as mom was alive, she was our only living parent. He said, as long as she lived, I would not have hurt her and dishonored her by making this step. And it would have hurt her. It, it was hard enough for her to accept that we'd stop going to church. And she didn't ask very many questions about what we were doing. Except when she would, I would say, Mom, if you really want to know, I'll, I'll give you the answer. And and her response to my answer was always, you just read too much. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, my, husband, I, my husband said to me, I wouldn't do it while Mom was alive. And I, he said, but I always knew we would. I said, well, you could have at least told me. He said, no. And this is just an example of the wisdom of my husband. He said, you and mom loved each other. And he said, you know, if you knew that she was the reason, the final reason that we were not taking this step, you would have grown to resent her. And he said, I didn't want that to happen. So he kept it to himself. But now he's ready to take that step. And so we went and got permission to apply to the conversion program. And for one year, they, they wanted us to go through the whole cycle of what a Jewish uh, experience, what a life as a Jew would entail, and what would be required, and of course you don't begin you you don't begin to learn it all. You absolutely there's no way you your whole life you continue to learn, but and the whole time they kept saying you don't have to do this. You can have a relationship with God without being a Jew. Don't you even think about doing this unless you're going to do all of it, not baby steps. You take it on. You commit to it. Be sure you want to do it. <clears throat> we were sure. We never backed up. Uh, Sev, can I tell about you? Well, he had been born on a farm with a with a, a country doctor, and so he had never been circumcised. So at, at, at sixty eight, he had to he had to become a Avraham and get a true circumcision. Never they never backed up for a minute. And the, the head of the bank then was, he loved to clown around and he would tease him all the time, you know, ready for the cutoff date. <laughs> and my husband <laughs> never backed up, one, <laughs> not for a minute. <laughs> so several months before we went to the mikvah, uh, he 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 actually was elevated. I, I was actually at a lower status than once he did that. And I'm telling you, my respect and awe for him just went up a thousand degrees whenever he did that because he he was... Happy to do it. He still would not change a thing at all. So anyway, we uh, on the fourth of a little, two thousand and eleven, we went to the mikvah, and you know it's it's interesting. There's a whole lot of things spiritually that change to your neshama whenever you become Jewish. One of the things that I know how true that is, 
that whole year that we were going through the practice of being Jews and, and learning what was required, there were a couple of times, and maybe this was my arrogance, I don't know. I thought to myself, you know, I can do this. I can actually do this. It, this it's okay. I'm, I'm going to be able to be a good Jew. It's like the minute I came out of the mikvah, it's like there was this big target on my back for the Yates Sahara not trying to knock me down. I had I absolutely I had I had no idea the the uh, what a foe that the Yates Sahara is, but I but I found out when I came out of that mikvah. Battles started in my thoughts in my mind, and oh, I don't have to do this. I can't even begin to tell you. I, I I have a whole new respect on what that Yetzirah is able to do that I had no idea until I came out of that next Um Anyway, we we lived there in Dallas for five years, learning, growing, letting our roots go down into our Yiddish kind. And um, then in 2015, my, my husband had open heart surgery. And that was a pretty serious time to stop and reevaluate things. And again, he knew how much that, that I wanted us to live in the land. You know, you read in the Torah over and over and over again how this, this land is Hashem's gift to his, to his children, to the Jewish people. And I kept thinking, how am I going to return my soul to him? one day and try to explain to him why I didn't accept his gift, why I didn't yearn for his gift. And we talked about coming and, and uh, you know, again, the difficulty of taking such a step, was something that we never quite um, agreed upon to do. But after his, his uh, very serious open heart surgery, he actually had a huge blood clot they were going to put in a stent and he had a huge blood clot headed for his heart and an hour into the procedure the the cardiologist came into the waiting room and told me oh uh, um he said I almost killed him now how many times have you had a doctor come in out of the surgical unit and tell that say that to you and I, I i just looked at him and i said what do you mean he said, I was going in with the with the stent and I encountered the biggest blood clot on its on its the way to his heart that I've ever seen in my life. He said, immediately I had to back out and call the thoracic surgeon and we've got to do open heart surgery to save his life, which they did. And and there were a couple of times in recovery that we almost lost him because he was pumped so full of, of blood thinners. But they couldn't go back in and stop the the ple bleeding he was having because of all the blood thinners in his. I was sitting sitting by his bed, doing to heal him one day, one morning, it's Shabbos morning, and uh, watching watching the all the readings on his his uh, machine they have you hooked up to going down and down and down. And the nurse sticks her head in and said, "You have guests." I thought Shabbos morning guest. What do you mean? Two of our neighbors had walked all the way to the hospital to come and, and see if we're okay. And I just handed her my to him and I said, Betsy, you pray. I said, he's died. And I went back in to his room and just prayed my own prayers. And as I sat there, I, I watched those, those readings. I'm sorry if this would get my composure. Watch those readings come back to normal. And uh, another time they, they were having a, another issue with him, but Hashem pulled him through. And so after he came through all of that, we began to make our serious plans. He said, you know, we need to go ahead and go to the land while we can. So it took us six, eight months, I don't remember, to prepare. It's it's not easy to make Aliyah. It's not easy to, no. to, to uh, do that. But, you know, the preparation for it is is uh, just the beginning. <laughs> Living in, in the land is a challenge. It's a challenge. It's the hardest thing that we have ever done. The hardest thing, but it's also the best thing that we've ever done for ourselves. And even in spite of the war that's going on right now, we live in the north of Israel, five miles from the Lebanon border. And if you follow the news at all, 
you know what's going on right now here in the north. But neither one of us would change a thing. We are where we're supposed to be. We know where we're supposed to be. We don't know why. You know, we don't. We're two people with no children. We we bring uh, that are that are Jews. They're all still fulfilling their purpose on the paths that they're on. But they they didn't come with us. They're they're not Jewish. They're not the they know of. They're they're still living as Christians, and uh, that's their path. Uh, that's what they're supposed to be doing, and, and we're very proud of the things they bring to this world. They bring such goodness in so many ways. So here we are living out this last segment of our life, however many years we have left. My husband's 81. I'm 78. We know that most of our life is in a rearview mirror rather than ahead of us. And yet we just we're grateful for every challenge. We're grateful for every thing he's done. It's God's mercy. I, I haven't begun to tell you all the little individual anecdotes about the miracles in our life that, that he's done really from my birth until this very day, it's been all his mercy and his goodness. That, yeah. yeah. So I want to encourage every one of you. I don't care who you are. This, this is my story. We all have our own story. You have your story. Hashem has that plan for you. Trust him. Keep walking. Whatever you want, he will give you the desires of your heart. You can trust him. You can just trust him. For everything, even your kids. But you have it. You also listened at, at at all the time. Yes. You know, not and not everybody wants to hear. That's the thing. It's I, you know. First of all, let me say hello to my friend Zev. I know he's off camera, but hello, Zev. He doesn't hear me because you have the earphones on. But but um, you said that he's camera shy. And he didn't want to. I know he's sitting near you, but um, so I just want you to tell him how much we appreciate his part of the story. So. It's so amazing that you, you know, you made all of these transitions and, and each one was so amazing, leaving the church and then becoming a Noahide and then deciding that you want to become Jews. And then in the midst of the Orthodox community in Dallas, I mean, I wonder how they reacted to your decision to make Aliyah, not the most popular decision in an Orthodox <laughs> American Jewish community, unfortunately. And then you move, not young people. Um, no, God, God willing, you have many healthy and one beautiful years ahead of you. But you move to a place in Israel which is so beautiful, so pastoral. It's such a wonderful place to live. But now it's basically like the front line. Practically, you are there. There are um, missile alerts very close to you all the time uh, on the near the Lebanon border. And so, goodness, it's like you've you've really. It's like Hashem is dealing with you all the time, like giving you new challenges all the time. And it's like you said when you came out of the mikvah, the target on your back, it's like as soon as you make a step for Hashem, it becomes more and more uh, noticeable that you're like your portfolio is open on his desk and we're all being constantly tested. And you, you, you've, you've described feeling that so strongly. Before I, I understood that there was a, that, that the Christian path was not for us, um, I remember one day lying on the carpet, just crying before God and beating the floor saying, who are you? Am I talking to this one or this one or this one? Or I just want to know who you are and what you want. I don't care what it costs. And I meant that. And that's still true. That's still my heart. I don't care what I'm here to do. I want to do it. I want to fulfill my purpose. That he has for me. So, of course, we take all these challenges. Um, one of the reasons we're in the north here on, on the Lebanon, when I learned when we moved here, only 30% of this part of, the, of Israel is Jewish, 70% is non Jew. And we're only two people, but that we brought our presence. We wanted to add our presence. You know, it, 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 I so wish that our, our Jewish brothers and sisters would come and we would populate this land from border to border. And then maybe our enemies would be take us seriously that we love this land and it belongs to us. But that was our motivation for being where we are. And here we will stay. I suppose if the, if the soldiers needed us to get out of the way so they 
could could deal with our enemy and we would not worry about protecting us. I suppose we would we would evacuate in the land. We would go so but we're planning to stay right here as long as we're allowed to stay. We're not this is where this is where we belong. <clears throat> Andrea, I'm I want to I always I'm always very curious. I, first of all, I, I really uh, appreciate your your hearing your experiences and very moved by them. I'm always curious because I I know from myself coming out of Christianity there was there was like one huge hurdle that I had to like jump over, and uh, I don't know if people have more than that. But do you recall a time when uh, you guys? Got to a point where it was like, like this one big hurdle. When you're when you're saying goodbye to the J man, was there anything that you had to get past, and then then you were able to you know like make a, a quantum leap forward in your in your pursuit of of the truth? Was there anything from from your old beliefs that you thought, well, I've got to resolve this, or was it just a series of things like that? I guess. Well, as I said, it was an eight-year st- course of study. It, it took us eight years to completely study ourselves out of error. Yeah. And you cannot study the Torah and remain in error. You just yeah. can't. Amen. So, yeah, it, it was a yeah, it was a whole. Se- every time we would encounter something and realize that it was almost the opposite was the truth of what we'd been taught, and so we had Whatever. to let go. Whatever happened to the to the gentleman who uh, the who went to Walmart and and continued to teach? Uh, <laughs> whatever, what where is he today? Do you know? He is with us in today. During COVID, we lost uh, him and his oldest son. Okay. Uh, we're still reeling from that. We really are. But he and his family probably fifteen years ago. Made Aliyah. First, they they left East Texas and went to uh, Flatbush, New York, and um, the whole family ended up making Aliyah. He has two sons. So he did uh, convert. Oh yes. Yeah. So oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, he he yeah. he went okay. he went to New York to convert under the, the most okay. stringent rabbi that they could find that would convert them, mm-hmm. because he knew that he would be having children. Uh, to grant his his boys would be having families. And he wanted to be sure that no one ever questioned the fact that they really had converted and they truly were Jews. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wanted, and and they, in fact, they raised their grandchildren that they didn't know that their fathers were converts until they were almost bar mitzvah age because they wanted to, them to just totally be accepted and, and live as Jews, which they do. But, okay, he and his wife came, married son and his wife, and, and they had three children at that time came. Their daughter-in-law's mother converted and made Aliyah. (laughs) The son married. Now um, there are 10 grandchildren and six great-grandchildren and counting, and they're all in the land, and the Uh, mother-in-law. His uh, wife lives with the youngest son, and, uh, and he's with Hashem. That's amazing. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yochavid, I want to thank you for being with us today. And I, first, I thank you for coming into my life oh, three decades ago. Oh, um, <laughs> you, you also, Rabbi. Uh, allowing me to be part you, of your journey. And uh, I think you've really blessed our audience with this amazing story. And may Hashem continue to bless you and Zev with many beautiful, healthy, wonderful, happy years together. Thank uh, you. You're, the, you're, on the, the, you're on the front line right now. <laughs> So may yeah. I, may Am Yisrael be victorious in this battle, and may Hashem's name be sanctified. And well, we, as I say, I'd never, I wouldn't rather be anywhere but right here, right now. So, whatever Hashem wants. I mean, and may everyone follow their their path and listen to Hashem Amen. calling to them. And yes, yeah. thank you, Chavad, very much. Thank you. Shalom, shalom. <laughs>